Well, if you've been with us uh, the last couple weeks in Ruth, um, you guys know this. I'm just going to give a little recap in case you haven't. So um, Ruth is the daughter-in-law of a Israelite woman named Naomi. And um, Naomi and her husband and her sons, they all like had a famine. So then they left. They went to Moab, which were like mortal enemies, kind of like Red Sox, Yankees, but way worse. Um, mortal enemies, and, and they lived in Moab. The sons took Moabite wives, um, lived there for about 10 years, and then the famine ended. Uh, but right before the famine ended, the husband died, the sons died, and so Ru- or Naomi's just like, man, my whole life is crumbling. I've lost everything. I'm just going to go back home. Y'all stay here. And Ruth's like, no, I'm going to go with you. Um, the other daughter-in-law was like, all right, cool. Yeah, I'll stay here. So Ruth and Naomi, they go back. Um, and then last week we saw Ruth was like, well, I, I know that God has put in his law these provisions for foreigners, for widows, for poor people. And so I'm going to go what they call glean. And so as all of the harvesting is happening, there's, you know, some grain that falls on the ground. And so um, God actually told the Israelites, he said, don't collect that because I want to make sure that the people who aren't able to harvest grain can come by and they can at least have food for the day. And so she goes, and it just so happened, she lands in the field of this man named Boaz, who happened to be one of their family's redeemers, which means he was some relative of Naomi's deceased husband. Um, And God set up laws that people could, um, like a a brother or a cousin or someone, um, could actually take the widow or take the widows, marry them, provide for them, redeem the land, and even for those who didn't have a male heir, be able to provide a son to carry on the family line. And so that's kind of where we left, right? And I think it's, it's exciting and fun, but you're also like, yeah, but what's going to happen? You know, because we're only halfway through the story, so it's not just like, and then they lived happily ever after the end. But what happens here, and I think what, what happens like in life sometimes, sometimes, with, you know, Naomi chapter one, she had a really rough go, then things get a lot better. You know, her, her daughter-in-law meets this guy. He's really cute. They talk about all that stuff. He gives him a bunch of food. Like, everyone's happy, but you're kind of like, yeah, but there's still something deeper. They're still single. They're still kind of, like, there's still redemption to be had. And so you're like, yeah, but their story hasn't fully been, like, yes, they have dinner tonight, and they have a guy in town that's looking out for them, but there's something deeper as we as just readers, we're like, yeah, there's got to be a better ending than that. And obviously, as we'll continue to read, there is. And even in our, our passage today, we, we see that there is hope. But even by the time you get to it, you're just like, wait a minute, there's another guy that is in line first? I, I don't like how that ends. Boaz is just supposed to take her right off into the sunset and then that's it. That's what's supposed to happen. And so you're kind of like, okay, I see the tide turning. I see God starting, you know, all the chips starting to fall, as you may. Like, God is clearly working all of these things to some redemptive end. But then where they're at, where she gets home that morning, she's just told, wait. Just wait. I think... For some of us who are in those, you know, okay, we came out of a horrible situation, things are starting to go, and maybe, I don't know if you're running out of steam or it just hasn't come fully to the fruition yet, whatever you've been praying for, yearning for, longing for, you've been trying to be as faithful as you can, trying to be patient, but you're just like, all right, I know I need to wait on the Lord, but I don't know what that means. I mean, that's a great biblical concept. Scripture says, wait on the Lord, we'll wait on the Lord, and you're like, what does wait on the Lord mean? Does it mean we do nothing? Does it mean we we work hard? Does it mean we're like, what do we do? How do we wait on the Lord? And what I think we see in Ruth 3 is what it looks like to wait on the Lord. What it looks like to wait on the Lord. So what I want to do before we even look at what each of the, because each of these characters in their own way, again, kind of like last week, they they give us a really good model of what it looks like to wait on the Lord. But before we even get to what they do, I want us to just notice their heart, motive, like their disposition behind what they do. And here's what I mean. Like, so if you look at chapter three in verse one, it says, then Naomi, the mother-in-law said to her, Ruth, my daughter, 
should I not seek rest for you that it may be well with you? And you're like, wait a minute, Naomi's doing something. Naomi has not done anything really other than complain. Um, At the end of last week's chapter, we saw her bless someone, but like she hasn't been, she's like, hey, I'm ready to get to work. I'm ready to do something for you so that you might find rest. And that's what's fascinating is she's the one that's like, I came back empty. I went away full, I came back empty. The Lord has dealt bitterly with me. Like she's been the sob story of the whole book of Ruth. And yet here, when she starts to move, it's not like, hey, Ruth, I'm gonna come out with you because I'm hungry too. But it's, no, Ruth, I want to find rest for you, not for myself. So as we saw last week, her her kind of, her whole disposition changes. She, hope is reunited in Naomi. And that leads her, you would think it would make sense for her to go, great, well, let's get to work. Time to turn my life around. But she's like, no, I'm actually gonna use this energy and this renewed hope to actually seek the good of my daughter-in-law, the good of somebody else. And she says, is not Boaz our relative? with whose young woman you were, see, he's winnowing. And then she hatches this plan. And so she's actively trying to move, not necessarily just for her own concern, like her own self, but her concerns actually on the good of Ruth. She seeks Ruth's good. And then Ruth goes along and agrees with the plan because she realizes this isn't just rest or redemption for me. I mean, because really what the law was about was the redemption of Naomi. Again, I said this week one, this story, it's called Ruth, and she's kind of the main character, but it's really Naomi's story. It starts with Naomi, it ends with Naomi, even when Ruth's son is born, spoiler alert, next week, when Ruth, Robert's preaching it, so I can spoil it, Um, but when, when Ruth has a child that's born, they don't say, oh, Ruth, you've been given a son. No, they say, Naomi you've been given a son. It's all about her redemption. And so that's what Ruth is seeking here. She's seeking Naomi's redemption. And she's been caring for Naomi all over the book. I mean, back in chapter one, she said to her, when when Naomi was like, look, look, Orpah went back. Why don't you go back with Orpah and just go uh, like dwell with your people in Moab, worship your gods, do all of that. And Ruth said, don't urge me to leave you. Where you go, I'm going to go. Where you lodge, I'm going to lodge. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. And this is what's wild and fascinating. I don't know if you picked up on this back when we were in chapter one. It says, where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. She's like, I'm giving up everything. I'm not even saying like, I'm going to be faithful until you die. But even after you die, I'm still going to not leave. And I'm going to be buried right next to you. And if I don't do that, may the Lord do that to me. I mean, she gave up everything. And then even last week, Boaz acknowledges. He says, I can see that you love the Lord. I can see that you've taken refuge under the shadow of his almighty wings. Why? Because of how you cared for your mother-in-law. I mean, Ruth has given up her whole future, her whole youth, her whole prospect of trying to find a spouse and start a new life for this old, sad bitter mother-in-law. She's given it all up. And she's done it so gladly and so willingly because she's, Ruth was seeking the good of Naomi. So you're like, okay, Naomi is seeking the good of Ruth. Ruth is seeking the good of Naomi. That seems like a really great friendship. Um, Then along comes Boaz, who has been resolved on trying to care for both of them, Ruth and Naomi. I mean, he, in chapter 10, when we'll get to what happens in the threshing floor, but when he finds out it's Ruth, look at the first thing that he says. He says, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You've made this last kindness, this chesed, this steadfast love, what what you are doing for Naomi and for just your family as a whole is even greater than you seeking to provide grain for them. You've made this act of God's love through your agency greater than the first in that you haven't gone. You could have gone after some young guy with a promising future. You could have gone after somebody who was more attractive. You could have gone after somebody who had more money, who you liked more, but you realized I am a redeemer 
And so your concern for your family was better than whatever you wanted out of life, out of marriage, out of companionship. That's basically what he's saying here. He acknowledges to her, I realize that you are doing, and so what does he do? He blesses her. He blesses her and says, now my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask. And he's like, by the time they leave, I mean, then, you know, he gives her a bunch of grain as like a pledge of like, I am going to do this. And just makes it abundantly clear that no matter what, he's going to see to it that she will be redeemed. And by extension, Naomi would be redeemed. And so he is intent, and, and we see, I mean, even Naomi knows this. In verse 18, it says, wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out. The man, Boaz, will not rest, but will set her, settle the matter today. Another translation says he won't rest until the matter is settled. He, it's going to happen. And he's resolved on what? On the good of Naomi. He's like, hey, I might not even be the one to redeem you. There's somebody else in line first, but I'm going to make sure you guys get redeemed. And so what we see in all three of these stories, like, how we wait on the Lord is first, I think just our heart disposition is not on ourselves, but actually selflessly seeking the good of other people. We see that in all three of them. All of these characters are seeking to meet needs, not of their own, but of somebody else. And I think this is especially convicting for me because when I'm faced with problems, I always just go, okay, great, we need a solution. Let me sit down and think about the best way that we can do this. And typically when I'm writing down ideas, or mentally writing down ideas, or telling Siri to remind me an hour later to write down an idea. Almost all of those ideas are, are like, how is this best going to set me up? Which makes sense. It's very sensical. It's, it's natural for that. But it is selfish only to look at how we will best benefit from this, and what would most benefit us from this. And I think what's even more fascinating is that's not how God designed us to come up with solutions. I mean, if you read all of the laws, not just in the Old Testament, you even read the one another's in the New Testament, like God gives reason behind these commands. He's not just saying, do this, don't do that, eat this, don't eat that, cut this, don't cut that. Like he's not just saying these things just to say these things. He's giving reason behind every single thing that God commands to do. Even, I mean, we saw that last week. He's not just saying, hey, leave some stuff on the ground so that you're more efficient and you can pick up more throughout the day. Or, you know, hey, just leave some stuff behind because, you know, there's going to be people. But he's like, no, I care for the marginalized. I care for the orphan. I care for the widow. I care for those who are foreigners who are sojourning in this land. My heart is for them. You better leave that stuff on the ground because I want you to know and I want them to know that I love them. God reveals his heart behind all the laws. You'll, you'll find it. But when we think about it that way, if we only seek our good, this is what's fascinating. If I face with a problem, I come up with a problem, and I go, this is how I'll get out of it, right? It, that might work. And I might even involve people in it. But whenever that happens, because I created the plan, relied on myself, and accomplished it, I'm like, well, good. Went according to plan right? Never have I come up with a plan, it worked, and been like, whoa, I'm so amazed that that worked. No, because I'm like, no, I, I planned it out. I thought it would work. That's why I did it. It makes sense. And so there's not like any room then to be amazed by God's grace. Whereas when we're seeking the good of others, it just, it kind of opens the door up to something a little bit more amazing to happen. Here's, here's what I mean. Imagine that you have a spouse or a friend or something and you approach them out of demanding something from them versus out of, I want to give something to you, right? If, if demand, I tell couples this all the time in premarital pre counseling. I'm like, hey, if you just say, hey, this is what I need, I'll do what you need if you do what I need and vice versa. Kind of a sad marriage, but that's that like you can get what you want, but then it's just like, well, yeah, of course I got what I want. I asked for it, and then I did what they wanted. And so it's kind of turning into a business transaction, right? But if instead you said, hey, what do you want? What do you need? And how can I help meet that? 
That's my first question. Not how can you meet my needs? How can you meet my wants? But how can I meet yours? Even if the same goods and services or whatever is exchanged, there's actual joy there. And a lot of times, and what we even see here with, with Ruth and with Boaz, is that it ends up actually answering some things and, and just like Boaz's generosity gives her, I mean, she goes in saying, man, I hope that our family could get redeemed. I'm just gonna ask, hey, for the sake of Naomi, do you think you could do this? And Boaz is like, I'll do that. I'll make sure you're redeemed. She's redeemed. Oh, and I'm gonna send you home with this huge sack of barley or wheat or whatever it was. And did you notice what he said when he did that? Look at verse, oh, where is it? Verse 14. Or sorry. Oh, I'm looking at verse, all right, hold on. I lost my place. Um, if you look at where he, he said to her, take these six measures of barley, verse 17, for he said to me, you must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. Empty-handed, that's the same word empty, that Naomi said at the city gates when she's wailing, I went away full, I came back empty. Boaz doesn't even, he was probably not there. He was probably on the field working, had no idea Naomi said that, and was just like, hey, this pledge that I'm gonna give you, I just want to send to you so that you won't be empty. And I'm sure Ruth is sitting there going, wait a minute, do you know what Naomi just said a couple weeks ago? He probably had no idea. But that's, that's just the Lord is, because he's like, I just want to meet your need. I want to be generous. I want to give. I'm so focused on you, not me, that I just, and then God ends up not only satisfying this deep emptiness in Naomi, but also gives a pledge of, hey, I'm going to make sure that this happens to you, Ruth. I mean, God set it up so that when we focus on other people's needs instead of our own, not only do then those needs get met, but it's so much better. I mean, there's so much more joy, there's so much more gratitude, there's so much more appreciation when it's a gift versus like, well, I asked for it, I asked you to do the dishes, and you did them. It's way better when your kids surprise you and look, mom, dad, I did the dishes. Now, don't do it with ulterior motives, but just because just I love you, not because I also want this thing later today, right? But I mean, that's, there's, there's joy there. And then there's a deepening of relationship, a deepening of love. And then we're like thankful to God, like, God, what a great gift that you would give me through this person. It's so much better than just, hey, give me this. I'll give you this. Great. See you. We'll send you on your day. When, when we wait on the Lord, I, I want us to just, before we get to the things that they do, we need to just check our hearts, all right? And, and just look at the hearts here in, in Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz, and go, are we concerned with how things are going, primarily concerned with how are things going to turn out for me? Or are we going, no, I'm going to go selflessly seek the good of others and just trust the Lord that they'll do the same. And if they do the same, we're all looking out for each other. Now it's not just Michael looking out for Michael, but it's Michael looking out for all of y'all and way more than one person looking out for my good. I mean, that just objectively is better. It also pushes you into a place where you see the goodness of God meet you in ways that you would have never been able to on your own, ever. All right, so when your heart is right, then and only then can we take initiative, get to work, all right? So we saw how this selflessness, now that their, their heart is, is moving towards what we see with all three of the characters is that they act very boldly. If you look at verse two to four, you look at Naomi's plan, you see her hope survived because, wait a minute, this guy that you met, he's one of our redeemers. And so she's like, all right, I got a plan. Let's get together. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to go freshen up, wash up, put on some perfume, put on the nice cloak that you have. You're going to go in discreetly. You're going to uncover his feet. And we're just going to trust that he knows exactly what to do. He'll tell you what to do. I don't know if Naomi just ran out of ideas there or if she was just trusting the Lord. Like, hey, this is bold. It's going to be crazy. You could die. But I trust that he will know the right thing to do. Because as we saw last week, he was a, he was a very wealthy man. He was a well-respected man. He was a godly man. And so she trusted his character. And so 
Um, she goes and she uncovers his feet. Now, I know there's different interpretations of that. I don't personally think that this is a sexual thing where Ruth is trying to go in to seduce him. Um, that word cloak is like, no, it's very much a clear covering. She goes in, she's like, I do want to make myself look presentable and attractive, but it's not in a seductive way. I want to just basically say, hey, I'm, I'm into you. I like you, but let's follow this God's way, not the way that, that our passions might lead us but let's follow the Lord in this. And so that's what Ruth does. She says, all right, I'll do it. And Ruth takes some bold steps. I mean, she, she puts herself out there. She, she's the one that makes the move. She's the one that makes the move. She was told to stay close to Boaz's men and women in the fields back last week. We saw that. And now here she is sneaking into the threshing floor at the end of the harvest. It's full of men. She's a woman. It's at night not married, neither is he. And I mean, she's, she's, a, she's a Moabite. The most, the least respected outsider of any type of ethnicity. And here she is sneaking around in the middle of the night. I mean, if she's caught, even if she explains herself, which we see, she's got the perfect alibi. Her motives are pure, but she could be in a lot of trouble if she's caught by the wrong person. A lot of trouble. What's even more wild is that when Boaz doesn't freak out, you know, Ruth's sitting there like, okay, Naomi told me that Boaz is going to tell me what to do. He says, who are you? She says, I'm Ruth, your servant. Then she kind of goes for it. She's like, spread your wings over your servant for you are a redeemer, which is not only her proposing to him, just wild, I mean, wild back then. But she's also quoting his words from the field. When he said to her, I've seen that you were the one that took refuge under the wings of God. And she's like, hey, I want you to be God's extension of kindness. Put your wings over me. Let you, I want you to be the one that the Lord uses to redeem our family and care for our family. You're like, whew. And I'm sure, I don't know if there was a long pause. I like to think things are dramatic. So I'm like, she's probably like, hello, Boaz, what's your answer? And I mean, but, but she's out there. I mean, just boldly putting herself out there. She could not only be made fun of, not only just mocked and, I mean, put on display of like, look at this woman who's sneaking into men's houses at night, trying to find a husband. I mean, there's no way you can spin that in a positive way. There isn't. And yet, she goes out there and, and she, she puts herself out. She could have even died. And, and, and what's, what's fascinating is Boaz is bold too. But what's, what's interesting about Boaz's boldness here is that his boldness isn't really in the crazy thing that he does, but it's actually his boldness is shown in his restraint. And here's what I mean. Ruth and Boaz are obviously attracted to each other, right? They both are expressing this. They express it clearly directly, purely. I mean, they're doing this in a very God-honoring way. And it's, it's wild that this Jewish man is going to take this Moabite woman who they weren't even allowed into church to worship. It's kind of bold what he's doing. But on top of him not doing anything promiscuous with her, he actually says, he could have said, hey, let's go down to the justice of the peace and let's get married. I am a redeemer. But what we see, which is even more bold, is he's like, well, technically, I know you guys don't know about this guy. There is another guy who's first in line. And I'm like, the first time I read that, I remember going, what are you doing, Boaz? Like, you had it in the bag. You could have just ran off with your bride, the end, happily ever after. It's, It's lawful. But he's like, yeah, but remember, this is a man who follows the heart of the law. He's like, yeah, but there is someone. We need to do what's right. We need to, not just because if I was in his shoes, I would want my fair shake at this thing, but I'm, I'm going to trust the Lord that if we walk in accordance with his word and how his word is laid out, God will take care of this. God will take care of this, and he does. So we see not only does he not take advantage of her there in the moment, but he also doesn't take advantage of his position as a redeemer when there's somebody closer. And so what we see in each of these three characters is 
not only do they selflessly seek the good of others, but they walk boldly in faith. It's not just walking boldly, right? It's not just, because some, some bold things people do, hey, I'm going to go jump the Grand Canyon. That's bold. I'm like, it is bold. It's also stupid, right? So sometimes being bold is dumb. Yes? Sorry if I use st- stupid, and that's a, not allowed in your house. I apologize. But it is sometimes, or what the Bible calls foolish, right? Sometimes being bold is foolish. So that's why I say we walk boldly in faith. We walk in line with his word. In faith, like seeking the good of others, seeking to follow God's word. And as we seek to do that, it will sometimes lead us to places or situations that is quote unquote bold or countercultural or counterintuitive. I mean, again, Boaz, I mean, he could have just taken Ruth as his wife there on the spot. But he didn't. And you're like, Boaz, no. I really hope the other guy says no. Well, we'll find out next week. But I really, you know, I really hope it's Boaz. I mean, this is who I've been rooting for the whole story. The whole story, I've been trying, like, wanting this. And Boaz understands this. He's like, no, I'm going to seek the good of others. I'm going to walk in line with God's word. And I know, I know that God's going to take care of it. So when I say, like, boldly walking in faith, it could look like Naomi coming up with creative solutions. Just starting to think outside the box and and brainstorm ideas of just like, okay, maybe since God is supernatural and not really confined by time or space or resources or anything, maybe God can do something a little out of the ordinary. And like Naomi, be able to assert, hey, let's, let's do this. Let's walk. I got a crazy idea but it's in line with God's word and let's just trust that he will take care of this. So maybe, maybe that's it. Or maybe like Ruth, it's like walking boldly is being assertive and putting yourself out there. Saying, hey, this is, this is something, I mean, even at the risk of your life, saying, no, this, this is something I I know that I, I, I have to do. I want so badly to love my family that even if it costs me my social status, even if it costs me all my money, even if it costs any prospect of ever being married again, I'm going to do this because I want God to bless my family. I mean, that's that's Ruth's mindset here. And I would add, add too that walking boldly by faith could look like Boaz restraining his desires and not even acting on his ability. He could have redeemed her. But he holds that back because he says, no, I I want to be more faithful to God, not just following the letter of the law, but the heart of the law. And I'll, I'll put it in his hands. I'll trust him. I mean, some of you guys need to hear that when we wait on the Lord, that's not a passive thing. It's not just us sitting around in bed going, well, I'm just going to wait for something to drop in my lap. God is going to call some of you out of your comfort zone. I remember back in March, I was at a conference and one of the pastors was like, God is calling some of you to do something and you are terrified. And I was like, "Mm mm-hmm, yep, that's me. And he's just like, yeah, you don't need every single dollar accounted for and every step laid out before you just follow the Lord and what he calls us to. Just be faithful. Go for it. Again, don't be dumb. But as long as you're walking in a line with his word and you do crazy bold things, just trust that the Lord will make good on his promise. And that leads us to the third point. Not only are we selfishly seeking the good of others, boldly walking in faith, but we also need some patience. A lot of patience, right? I mean, it's, it's crazy. Like, the selflessness that they have for one another is just wild. The boldness, some of the things that they do, you're like, that's wild. But then given what's at stake, I think what's even crazier than all of that is the patience that they have, because at the end of this story, this situation is in none of these three characters' hands. It's in some guy who lives somewhere in town who just happens to be closer related to Naomi than anyone else. And you're like, well, 
We'll see you tomorrow, turns out. I mean, they, they literally have to sit and be patient. I mean, but even at the beginning of the story, when Naomi sends Ruth off to Boaz that night, she has to sit at home. They didn't have Find My Friends. They didn't have Life 360. Like, she couldn't track, where's Ruth going? Send, send me a text when you're there. Give me an update. How are things going? She's just sitting at home, waiting to find out what happens. It's completely, she, she created the plan, but now it's out of her hands. She has to trust the Lord. She has to trust, trust that Boaz is the man that she thinks he is. She has to trust that Ruth would do what she planned and that Ruth also would walk in righteousness. And then Ruth, she has to trust the Lord that he's going to protect her as she ventures into this wild party where they're eating and drinking and then having all their stuff over there and she's just sneaking over in the corner waiting for them all to fall asleep. And then when she puts herself out there, she's like, all right, Boaz, what's your answer? She's got to wait. And even when she gets home that night, Naomi says, wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out. She's probably, probably did not sleep all night. Probably anxious, but she, she has to wait because it's, it's not in her hands. And even Boaz is left waiting. That's what's funny is Naomi's like, no, he's going to make sure it happens. But Boaz is like, yeah, but the other guy in front of line could, could do this. And if he does, I mean, he says this, if he, if he does it, then he does it. But if not, I'll step in. I'm willing. I'm ready. I would love to. But I'm going to wait. It's not in my hands. I mean, and that's what just absolutely blows my mind. Like they're all doing insanely bold things, but they're also going, yeah, it's not ultimately in my hands. I'm going to follow the, God's word. I think a lot of times like we, we think we need to just strong arm like if there's some problem or something unresolved in our life, we're like, well, I have the ability. I can do this. I'm going to do this. And so I'm just going to take whatever I can to accomplish that thing. And then if I need some extra strength at the end, I'll ask God to help in prayer. But they're like, no, I'm going to do bold things and then I'm going to go home and rest and wait. And it's not like this, like, God helps those who help. That's not at all what I think this passage is doing. It's like, no, walk boldly and faithfully in accordance with God's word as you seek to be his conduit of grace to other people and just trust him. Sometimes it means, yes, you wait. And sometimes it means you do crazy things. But we need to trust him. We need to trust him. And that's what I think we see last is just they, they patiently trust in God's promises, which I know is a very hard, I mean, Boaz, mm, he, he like, it had to be so hard when there is an easy, not sinful way right in front of him. He could, it was not sinful or outside of the law for him to marry her. But he fights that temptation to take things into his own hands even when he could have been technically right, that's me as the middle child loving to find a loophole in whatever, right? Well, technically it's not wrong for him to do that. But he says, no, my heart, like I understand the heart of the law and I want to follow God's word and I'll trust him even when it's hard. And so yes, be faithful, work hard, work boldly, act boldly, but also be patient. Be patient. I mean, that's the thing, especially for those of us who are younger, we want results now. And you sit, I mean, I've, I've seen this with older pastors who have pastored for decades, and they're just like, hmm, yeah, give that person some time. The Lord will work on them. And you're like, what? No, I need them to change now, right? But no, just give a little bit of patience. Give it some time. Things will work out. Sometimes... Remember, God doesn't think about years in the same way we do. His patience is just different. Sometimes it's instantaneous, but also sometimes it takes years and years and years and years and years, decades of just faithfully praying, faithfully discipling, faithfully getting up and going to work and providing for the people that you care most, faithfully bringing people into your home and being generous with them faithfully teaching your kids the stories or the songs of the Bible over and over and over and just pleading with them even when they're 40 years old. I want you to know this. 
years and years and years. None of that's lost on the Lord. His timing is perfect. We need to be patient. We don't need to take things into our own hands. And I heard someone once say, well, put it in God's hands. And I'm like, well, actually, it's always been in God's hands. So when we try to take things into our, our, our own hands, it's not like it's just sitting there and we're like, oh, I'll grab that. It's like, no, God, give me this, right? No, but just say, no, I know it's in your hands. I'm gonna just walk in line with your word and trust that you will work through me. Let me just end with this. What, what I love about Ruth 3, yes, it's very practical. I didn't even get into the whole dating stuff. We, you can talk about that in your community group um, later this week if you want. There, there is a lot of just practical application and just really good instruction on how we as men and women should live our lives with patience, with righteousness, with boldness, with selflessness, like all of these things. But, but more than an instructive application on how to wait on the Lord, what we see here is actually like the way of the gospel. I mean, you read back through this. You think of God who in his infinite wisdom created a plan of redemption for sinners who would otherwise have no hope who were dead in their trespasses and sins and owed an eternal debt that they could not even pay on their own. And he's like, yeah, I, I, not only do I have an idea, but I have the idea, and it was the idea before I even created the world. Pretty creative when you think about what God did in Christ at the cross where our sin was paid for and Christ was raised and we get to be with him forever. Pretty amazing. So we see just hints of Naomi's creativity, just hinting at just the absolute breathtaking creativity of God's plan to save us. And we see Jesus, I mean, boldly coming to earth as, through the form of a baby. I mean, you read the birth narrative. I mean, his parents are running for his life because there's rulers trying to kill him before he's even born boldly comes and is, is, is mocked by the very people he came to save. And he said, yeah, I'm going to do whatever it takes, even if it, give, even if it takes my own life to secure the redemption of my brothers and sisters. And that's exactly what Christ did. And he didn't rest until it was accomplished. And he gives us this pledge. Like, boy, he gives us a pledge, the Holy Spirit. We do, yes, we get partial rest, but... Also, we, we get him as, as we get to walk in holiness and await his return and get the fullness of our redemption, the fullness of rest. So don't just take Ruth 3 as like, well, okay, here's the things I need to do and the things I don't need to do. But no, this is pointing us to something bigger, better, and greater. Like if you've never heard that before, you're like, Michael, yeah, I, I don't know what this whole waiting on the Lord thing is. I'm just, I just need something. I promise you that if you come to Christ, what he offers you is, is so much better than your heart's deepest desire. It is. And not only does he promise you, hey, one day you'll be totally free from that, but I'll even give you freedom here and now from that. You get to experience that joy and, and, and walk in the fullness of life now. And for those of us who are in Christ, as we wait for his return, yes, we should selflessly, boldly, and patiently follow his word as we seek to love those around us because at the end of the day, all we're doing is just reflecting his incredible love for us. And we'll wait. We'll wait just like Ruth and Naomi and Boaz waited for the morning. We wait for Christ to come back for us.